Hey guys, I am Scott, a videographer based out of Brooklyn, New York, and this is my weekly series where I try to recreate something that I was inspired by on the internet. And in this week, I am recreating this amazing stop motion by Kevin P. Berry, where he animates himself. And oh my God, I just love this so much. This is so creative and fun, and I love it, I love it, love it. But my goal was to try to recreate it this week and see what I could learn. I'm not really familiar with doing a lot of stop motion. So I was really looking forward to this fun and exciting challenge and I get to just do it right here in my apartment. Kevin P. Berry is an insanely talented stop motion animator and his work is so fun to watch. I highly recommend checking out his Instagram account. So this is what I created. And the idea of it is I am just updating my portfolio and my hands are gonna lend me a helping hand, but they're a little forceful and we're gonna give me a profile photo. Super silly, super fun. But so yeah, that is my attempt. So I ended up tying this five different times and now I wanna share with you what I learned going through the process of doing this. So first, in doing some research, I found that the software that most stop motion animators like to use is a software called Dragon Frame. And then they'll use a remote trigger to fire off the photo every, every time that they're taking a photo. And what Dragon Frame allows you to do is kind of see an overlay of what it is that you're doing. So you can see the photo that you just taken and then see the photo that you're about to take or like a live preview of the photo that you're about to take. So that way you can make sure that your movements are fluid and they look smooth. You know, I don't know how much um, stop motion I'm gonna do. This might be the only one. So instead of buying the software, I'm just gonna use my strengths, which are time-lapse photography, and try to see if I can get a similar effect with just doing it via time-lapse. And so my plan is, yes, I'm gonna be, you're gonna see, there's gonna be photos of me moving around and moving things, but I can just delete those and um, mask out parts where I'm holding things, moving things. And my thinking is I'm gonna probably get a really similar effect. We're shooting this with two cameras, a Sony a7R three, which shoots 8K stills, and that's gonna be the camera in the back that we're gonna be able to see like this wide scene of my office. Um, and then we're gonna also shoot it on a Sony a7S III, which shoot 4K stills, and it's gonna be kind of like the portrait camera, and we're gonna have this backdrop behind me, just kind of looking like we're getting a normal headshot. So for the camera settings on both cameras, I actually set them to take a photo every two seconds. And I believe that it's like an F9 and 1 30th of a second of a shutter speed. So that way everything is still sharp um, and you can see all of this nice and sharp in detail. And normally when I shoot a time lapse, I like to use a silent shutter. But since I was going to be moving and I wanted a way that I knew when to move, I turned my silent shutter off and just had the normal shutter. So that way when it took a photo, I knew I could then move. And anytime that I was moving and I just heard the shutter, I would just hold still and just let it take another photo and then keep moving. So there's two things that were really difficult to this. One was the choreography, trying to figure out where I'm gonna be moving and just making sure that certain things were gonna not intersect with me and just planning it out and getting logistically all in the right places. Cause I didn't want the door to open, but then when I got into the editing room, it would have opened on me. So just making sure I hit all the right marks. And then the second most difficult thing is um, getting used to how many photos you need to take for the different movements. And every time that I did it, I would look at what I was doing and see how the movements looked and I try to adjust them. But this is where I really started to appreciate Kevin's work. Um, and when I was scrolling through his feed, I actually saw this one post where he talks about where he was animating and working with this rig and he spent a whole year just with this rig, learning to animate it or working on his animation with it just for a few shots in a movie. And to me, it kind of really led like to Malcolm Gladwell's idea that it takes 10,000 hours to master something. And that's where I think like Kevin's work really shines because of how fluid all of the movements are. And it just made me really appreciate that. The other things I learned are one, 
it's way easier to do this if you have another person moving the objects because there, there's a lot of moving parts and it's easy to overlook something. The second thing I learned is you really do need more photos than you need. It's, it's just like a time lapse. More photos is better because you can always speed things up or delete some of the extra ones. When I was doing it, when I was taking the photos, it felt like I was getting enough photos. But when I looked at it on the editing software, it just felt a little bit rushed for my liking. For example, the smile, I wanted to have a part where the hand actually forced a smile on my face and I had to slow that down. I would have liked you to see the gradual change. And the last thing I learned is that stop motion is pretty fun. Um, this was a lot of fun. I love that, like how creative I was able to be in just a small space. And to make this more approachable, I actually did a lot of this in Premiere. But before I got into Premiere, I first sifted through all my photos and just deleted the ones where I was moving and exported the bits where the camera and the tripod moved as separate time lapses. And then I brought them all into Premiere and put the main action shots of me on track one and then stacked the camera and tripod scenes on top of them. And then all I needed to do was simply build a little mask around the tripod. Again, this is why I had to plan it out so much is because I didn't want the door opening to intersect with me while I was in the chair. And for the bit where the camera flies in it, all I needed to do was just create a mask around the camera for 10 photos while it was in the air. And here's a little bit where I did intersect it. So I had to make I had to make sure I was really precise with the mask for these few frames, which also shows that I had a slightly different exposure. So I just had to add a lumetri color correction to better match the colors. Once that was done, I just needed to insert the second series of photos and make it look like it was in the viewfinder of the camera. And you can easily do this in Premiere using the corner pin tool. But for some reason, I got this error saying the image was too big for Premiere. So it may be something with the resolution in my 8K stills that Premiere can't quite handle it. So what I did is I just nested the whole composition and slowed it down 50%. It made it a little bit, it made it half the speed so you could see what was going on a little bit better. Once I nested it and saved the project, I opened it as a dynamic link in After Effects. And since I know I'm gonna be sharing it into Instagram, I switched the settings from 8K to 1080 by 1350. And also because I want to animate the camera, I turned my layers into 3D sequences and added a 3D camera. And I created an animation to zoom into the camera screen, added the corner pin tool just like you would in Premiere and put the footage into the display. And because of the nature of the corner pin, it kind of smushes things in a little bit, changing the perspective. I just, so I just fudged the numbers around a little bit, duplicated the layer, removed the 3D and corner pin effects, and framed it exactly how I wanted it to be framed in the video. And then I just changed that layer to difference mode so I could more easily see what needed to get aligned and zoomed and everything. Once it was aligned, then I just fine-tuned when the animation took place. And that was pretty much it. Then I just downloaded some assets and sound effects from Envato Elements for fun. Once that was done, I took photos of my hands holding shirts and my hands making the different gestures. I shot those against the same background and just rotoscoped them out and put them directly on top. And voila, you have some fun movie magic. All right, well, that's pretty much it. Let's just wrap up with some thoughts. Overall, I'm pretty happy with the results and how it came out. I think definitely with Dragon Frame, it probably would have been, it probably would have looked a little bit more fluid. But by, by doing this as a time lapse and just going through the motions of this, I think it's really fun and exciting and just kind of unlocking something new. I'm pretty happy with how the zoom through the camera came out, even though I, I really loved how Kevin slapped his hands and like the, I love that idea. And even though I started off exactly doing the exact same thing, I think that we went a fun different direction with it and tried to tell a story and, and ultimately I'm, I'm happy. All right, well, that is it for this video. And just like other weeks, I haven't quite figured out what I'm gonna do next week. So if you have any other suggestions or inspirations, send them in the link below. Otherwise, um, I'll, I'll be looking on the internet. So if you're liking the series so far, please consider subscribing to the YouTube channel and let me know what you think in the comments below. All right, well, I'm Scott, happy shooting and I'll see you next time.